know what we've been teaching on, right? We've been talking about uh, growing to maturity. So let's go to the next one that we have. The next one that comes right after that in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Now we t we're talking about the elementary teaching or the elementary doctrine, I should say. And these, these elementary teaching or doctrines is just like when you're in grade school. They go with you throughout your whole life. And they become, uh, they become a part of the basis whereby you not, only, you not only develop your own perspective, so to speak, or the way you interact with the world, but um, they become so embedded in us that uh, we call them, uh, it's pretty much second nature to you. Uh, uh, it becomes part of your consciousness, or, or better yet, you you activate them in your life without even thinking about it. For instance, if someone, if, if you have to solve a math problem, you'll be amazed at how fast you go back to some of the basic things that you studied, and then the things that was added on to that that you've learned in order to solve the problem. What I want to do tonight is we're going to talk about the doctrine of the laying on of hands, okay? And um, we all do that. And there are quite a few pe people that do it. Uh, I don't know how many, especially with this new breed and new generation of Christians that understand why you do it and what the Bible says about it. So I want to talk about uh, uh, that. It says uh, in Hebrews 6 and verse 1, it says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, the doctrine of baptisms, which we just concluded. And it says, and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. So, uh, to some people, when you talk about the laying on of hands, it, it, that may sound uh, uh, archaic or may sound like it's old, uh, but it's a very vital part of the operation of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of us that are in churches have seen people come down, you lay hands on them. We can quote James 5, 14, all the way to, I think it's 15, where it says, if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing with all, and what the prayer of faith will do. There are many, there are many, uh, when you study the scriptures, there are many reasons to lay hands on somebody in the church. But before we, we, we talk about this, I want, to, I want to frame our conversation tonight, or our teaching tonight, because I want, to, I want to frame it to where we see that God has a family just like we have a family. Now, we understand the scripture where it talks about that we are to raise up a child in the way that he should go, all right? And when he's old, he won't depart from it. Uh, we also understand the scripture where it talks about discipline in your child. Now, the, the old people, when they say raise up a child, and, you know, sometimes they're talking about make sure you pat them and give them the belt, right? But there's a little bit more to that than just that. Because when you raise up a child, notice what it says, raise up a child in the way that he should go. Raise up a child in the way that he should go. So what the Bible is talking about is not just the aspect of discipline from the point of, of beating them or giving them a weapon. That's, that's, that's part of that. But it's, 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 it's to help shape the child. It's to, it's to find the bent in the child, the, the thing that the child gravitates to. What are his gifts? What are his talents? You are the, 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 the family members. You have watched the child as the child is developing. What are those things that you see in that child that, that you could say, I see what that gift is, what that, what that, what that uh, God-given ability is, so that as that child grows up, then, then you're able to steer the child in the way that that child ought to go. The decisions that that child, you steer that child because you have seen the gifts or the talents 
the things that God has put into that child's life. And you can say, honey, why don't you consider this? So I've seen you from a child. This has been some of the dominant things that you have done in your life. And you're able to guide the child. Well, it's the same thing. If that's naturally speaking, then we can only imagine when it comes to God, how God would do with his family if he has a family. All right? And all of us are developing. All of us are growing up in the kingdom of God. What does God have to say about us? If he tells us that this is the way we ought to raise our children, then surely God then would have certain things positioned in his church to where the same thing can occur for his children so that we can grow up and fulfill the destiny that he's, that he's designed for us, right? Amen. So I want us to address this whole doctrine of the lay, laying on of hands. And, and, and I want us to just kind of look at it and talk about it from that, from that perspective because there are various reasons, again, why we lay hands on people. The laying on of hands is used in the Bible uh, many a times to confirm. Okay? You want to remember that. The, the, the laying on of hands many a time in the Bible, and we'll look at it, but it's used to confirm something to us. All right? It's also used to commission you or to send you forth or to release you in the destiny that God has entrusted or have called you to. And I want you to remember the things I'm talking about. I want you to, to get in mind that the church is a family. It's God's family. And that's why you have God, God has order and he put all these things within his body and how the Holy Spirit leads the body because remember, it's a family that God is wanting to develop and bring them all or bring us all to the place of maturity. So remember, the laying on of hands confirms things to you and to me. It, 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 it commissions us or God uses it in the church to, to commission us. Uh, uh, or, or to release someone into the grace of Jesus Christ. And that meaning that, that whatever it is that God is calling you to do, uh, uh, when, 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 uh, whatever it is that God is calling you and I to do, then there comes a time in your life in the church where the laying on of hands is used in order to release you into that. You can see in the Bible where you lay hands on the sick. We're very familiar with that. Jesus said in Mark, Mark 16, 15, that the, you, the believer will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And in Acts, you see, uh, you see that being used effectively of them laying hands on different people, uh, laying hands on the dead and, and so on and so forth and miracles taking place. The laying on of, uh, of hands, as I said before, remember, it's used to confirm and to commission. While there are various things that, that, that we use the laying on of hands for, uh, some of the ones that's real pertinent to us, uh, because in churches, a lot of times you see special services that's offered in order to do this, where people are uh, 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 either they're commissioned or they're confirmed. Now remember, you can be confirmed and not commissioned, which simply means someone could confirm what's in you, but it's not time to release you. All right? And we'll look, we'll look at these things in the Word of God tonight, okay? Uh, uh, sometimes both of them can happen in concert. They can happen together or simultaneously. All right. Now let's look at some examples in the Bible. Okay. Let's look at some examples. Do you remember? Let's go to First Samuel. First Samuel. And I'm going to show you something. Let's look at First Samuel and look look at chapter 16 in First Samuel. This is the first time uh, that you find the mentioning of, of of King David. Okay. This is the first time we find the mentioning of King David. And you, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 6. Now, this is, what, this is what happens here. God calls Saul to be king, right? He makes him king, but you know the story. Saul disobeys God. He does what he wants to do. And the Bible said it repented God that he made him king. And finally, God told uh, Samuel, he said, I want you to go to the house of Jesse, and I want you to anoint 
uh, 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 the, the next person that is going to be king. So Samuel goes to Jesse's house and he sees. Now here it comes. It says, verse 6, And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. You need to remember that. Okay? Because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadad and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. All these guys were handsome guys. They were guys that probably had great stature. They were probably muscular. Uh, from the outward, you and I would say, these guys are the ones that are supposed to be king. But look at how God does this. And it says, and Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen. The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, are, are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance. A teenager, right? And, and it says, And goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise. Now look what the Lord said here. He said, Arise and anoint him, for this is he. Say that? This is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now one of the things that, that uh, uh, Samuel did with David here is he confirmed. He confirmed something that God had revealed to him that belonged to David. I want you to look at some of the key points here. The key points here is that Samuel had nothing to do with this choosing. Okay? I want you to remember that. Samuel had nothing to do with this choosing. Okay? He, could, he didn't go in there and utilize his office to choose who he felt should be there. Samuel had nothing to do with this choosing. This choosing came from God and God alone. Okay? Remember that as we, as, we, as we move forward. God is the one that chose David. Another thing I want you to remember is that when, he, when, 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 when the prophet confirmed what God had said to him over David, the Spirit of God came upon David. But re remember something. David was not commissioned yet. Though the Spirit of God came on David, David had the Spirit on him, but he was not king yet, not in the natural, okay? And sometimes it happens like that to us, okay? God calls us, and when God calls us, he anoints us, but he doesn't release us yet. There's a difference here, okay? And we want to make sure we understand it. There's a difference here, but I'm talking about the laying on of hands, and why that is vitally important in the church. Okay? Uh, another person I want you to look at, I want you to go to Deuteronomy. Uh, let me see here. Go to, go to Numbers 27 and verse 18. Let's look at another person. And what I'm showing you here is the laying on of hands is not new. It's not new at all. The laying on of hands is not new. Numbers 27 and verse 18. The, the laying on of hands is not new. I'm giving you some scriptures, but you can go back and you can actually study that and you will find it all through the Old Testament, okay? It says here, it says in uh, Numbers 27 and verse 18, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, okay? Now who said this? The Lord said, don't, don't forget this. The Lord said unto Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, 
and lay thy hand upon him. Now, what you're going to find out is that when Moses proceeded to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, you're going to find that Joshua was always at Moses' right hand. He was the, he was the warrior, if you want to put it this way. He listened to Moses. He followed Moses. So watch me now. Watch me. Joshua was actively engaged in doing something. Okay, whatever it is that God had put in Joshua's heart, he was living that out before Moses and the rest of the children of Israel. Okay, so now God says to Moses, he said, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand upon him and set him before Eliezer, the priest, and before all the congregation and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of Israel, of the children of Israel, may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in. Both he and all all the children of Israel with them, even all the congregation. Now, now you may say, well, why the Lord is doing that? Well, when you get to the book of Joshua chapter 1, you find out why God was setting all this stuff up. You understand that? So what I'm showing you here is that God had a plan for Joshua all along. God, God is the one that had the plan for Joshua, not Moses. Okay? And Josh, God tells Moses what to do with Joshua. And so basically, what God had a plan for Joshua, and what God put into Joshua's heart, that Joshua was already enacting in, in, in some, in, at, some, at, at some level, he was already doing it in the camp. What Moses did when he put his hands on him and blessed him, Moses began to confirm what God was saying to Joshua so that Joshua could know it. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, have anybody ever confirmed you in your family? Have anybody ever said to you, girl, I see this and this and this working in you, and I, I see how God is using you. Oh, you can really do this so well. I have watched you for a while. How do you feel? What does it do to you? Well, it's the same thing in the body. <laughs> you see that? It's the same thing in the church, okay? There are things that God put into every believer. Now, this is a two-way street because what has to happen here, and, and even though we're talking about the laying on of hands, what I want to show you is not just the responsibility of, of those who lay hands on you, but it's also your responsibility of being a part of the body and serving the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Working in the body. You, you, you follow me? Because what you're doing is you're part of a family. Okay? And you are actively engaged in that family. That is very important. And I'll show you why. Okay? You have sometimes, especially today, you have folks that, that say they're part of a church. You never see them. They don't, they don't do anything. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not so much hung up on the building as much as... Uh, uh, the family of God. The church is God's family. And in that church, there is order. If God placed me in the body, then I have a responsibility to not only have that place that God put me in, but I am to provide whatever it is that I'm to provide that comes from that place where God placed me. I have a responsibility. Is that right? Are y'all following me? And so what happens is that when, 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 when God confirms to us, sometimes we are not to the place where God would release us into what he's called us to do, but the confirmation lets you know and those around you know that God not only sees what's in you, but God is confirming that you are what you're doing. Follow me. This is, this is, this this is very important. When I was first saved, uh, uh, I could not hide from anybody. Sometimes I would go to church. It didn't matter where I went to church. It didn't matter where. I was always called out. 
and I was always prophesied to. And the thing that God had called me to do, he made sure that he confirmed it over and over and over and over again. Okay? And he had his reasons why he did that. But, but the confirmation was valid. It was very important. And so it is in our lives, just like it was in their life. Now flip over with me to Deuteronomy 34. Let's look at this. Let's look at this. Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9. Remember, Moses laid his hands on Joshua here. And the Bible said when he's laid his hands on him, the spirit of God, the spirit of wisdom, uh, you see, uh, 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 th these things came upon Joshua. You say, why is that? Well, don't forget, Joshua is going to have to lead the children of Israel after Moses is dead. He's going to need all of that. Okay? He's going to need all of that. So, so just, just mentally mark these things in your mind. So Joshua, I mean Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9 say, And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. You see that? He was full of the spirit of wisdom. Watch this. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, what is happening here? Notice the spirit of wisdom came on him. God is the one that initiates this. God is the one that tells Moses to do this. Okay? Well, if God tells Moses to do this, that's because God has something in mind for Joshua. Are you following me? And it's the same thing with you and me. And I'm going to show you how it plays out for us today, okay? It is important then that you and I understand what Joshua received from Moses was not something that originated with Moses. Okay? Moses just didn't get Joshua and say, come here boy, let me lay hands on you. And when I lay hands on you, this is going to happen to you. No dice. No dice. That, that was not going to happen. The only thing was going to happen is that when Moses obeyed the Lord, then what God planned for, Moses, for, for Joshua, why God told Moses to do this, that is what was going to happen to Joshua. God is not going, listen to me, God never turned the church over into our hands. He did not turn the church over into human hands. The person that directs the church is the is the is the is the is the is the, uh, the the Holy Spirit. That's who directs the church. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church. That's who is going to direct it. No man can do this thing because they don't know what all God called you for. They don't they don't have the, the, the knowledge without the Holy Spirit revealing to, to them, they don't know what your position is in the body. The Spirit of God knows who you are. He knows how He created you. He knows what your gifts and talents are. And He knows when He wants these things to be released through your life. He knows these things. And so what He does, He is the one that directs all of this. 1 Corinthians 12. Are you following me? How many of y'all listening to me today? How many of y'all listening? All right. So this doesn't originate with Moses because Moses wanted it to, ha to happen. On the contrary, Joshua received what he was prepared or what God had prepared him for. Okay? So when we, when we talk about the laying on of hands, remember this. In other words, Moses laid his hands on Joshua to confirm to him what God said about him and what God said was in him. And notice this, it also confirmed to the rest of the people what God was doing in this man. Okay? Because when you come to Joshua chapter 1, they must respect him and they must see him as the next leader. So notice how God sets it all up. All right? Webster, the Webster Dictionary says that to confirm something is to establish the truth or the correctness of it. It means to verify, to authenticate, to attest to the truth or validity of something. To confirm implies the removing of doubt, 
by an authoritative statement or indisputable fact. Okay? And this is what this is what Moses did by the Spirit of God when he laid his hands up on Joshua. So now let's fast forward to the New Testament. Can we do that? Let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to the book of Acts. Okay, let's go to the book of Acts, okay? And let's look at Acts chapter chapter 13. And let me set this up for you, okay? Let me set this up for you. Because in Acts chapter 2, when the advent of the Holy Spirit came and people were filled with the Holy Spirit, once you get from Acts chapter 2, you find the acts of the apostles that are, that are uh, functioning in the church. Philip, in chapter 8, goes down to Samaria. He preaches Christ in Samaria. The people gave heed to Philip. The whole city came to God. Demons was jumping out of windows and out of people. Uh, 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 Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. They sent Peter and John down to, what? to lay hands upon the people that they might what? Receive the Holy Spirit. All right? Then when you go into chapter 9, there is a shift that happens. Because now there is a guy by the name of Saul that was breathing out cruelty against the people of God. And he was hauling people to jail, everyone that calls on the name of Jesus. So he received letters from the high priest to go down to Damascus and to find everybody who have turned to that name or call on that name and bring them to prison. He is on his way to Samaria, and, and, the, and the Bible said a great light, brighter than the noonday sun, slapped him off of his horse, right? Paul became blind, or Saul became blind when this happened. God so humbled the man that the one who was dragging people to prison, they had to lead him by the hand down. Okay, He had to depend on someone to lead him by the hand. And Paul went to this place, and he was there fasting and praying for three days. And in a vision, he saw a man by the name of Ananias that comes to him, lay hands on him, that he might receive his sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice what Ananias did. He, had, he laid his hands. Notice how God is doing the same thing all the way through the Bible. But then something happened after Paul... Uh, Ananias come to Paul. He lays hands on Paul. Paul got his eyes, his sight back. He was baptized and all of this good stuff. He started right off from preaching Jesus, right? But then after that, you don't see Paul anymore. You don't hear anything about Paul anymore. Chapter 10 talks about Cornelius. Chapter 11, and then you get to chapter 12. Uh, Peter is thrown into prison and all the stuff that's going on. At this point, you see that Peter is still what you and I call uh, the chief apostle that's kind of leading and moving the church along with the other apostles. But when you get into chapter 13, something happens here. Because the Bible tells you and I, in the book of Galatians, chapter, the latter part of chapter 1 and chapter 2, that after these things happened to Paul, Paul was into the deserts of Arabia. He went away because the gospel was revealed unto him by the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel that you and I are privileged to read about. He is called the apostle to the Gentiles, right? So Paul was doing all of that. And no doubt God moved him away because God had to do some things in Paul. And he had to teach Paul some things before Paul can really effectively fulfill what God had called him to do. So when we open chapter 13, when you open to chapter 13, look at this. It says, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Now who are these prophets and teachers? Listen to this. Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaum which had been brought up uh, with Herod, the Tetrarch. And then it says, and Saul. So chapter 13, we get a glimpse now of Paul, God bringing him back on the scene. And we see him here called that he is a prophet and he's also a teacher, right? 
Now, we know of this because in other places in the scriptures, the Bible tells us where Paul says that he's a teacher. But I don't see anywhere else where he calls himself a prophet. But this is what sometimes happens to all of us, okay? And to, or I should say to some of us in the body. Sometimes God starts you here, or he starts you in a, in a, a particular place. You're operating and functioning a certain way, and, and God has a higher calling for you. And so what God does is progressively he brings you there. And you go from one thing to the next to the next until he brings you into the destiny that he has planned for you. So Paul is operating as a prophet here, and he's a teacher along with Saul. Okay? Now, look at verse 2. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Okay? Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how long Paul was operating this way. But he does say that as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul for what? What are we separating them for? Okay, so the, this is the Holy Spirit now. The one who placed him in the body knows exactly why he called Paul and what Paul's mission would be. All right? So now, while they are fasting and praying, that means Paul, which is Saul, and, and Barnabas, and, and Simeon, and Niger, and, and of Cyrene, and Lucia, these, the, these few believers were fasting and praying as prophets, and the Holy Spirit speaks through one of them and, and gives a prophetic message and says, separate Paul and Barnabas now for the work that I have called them to. And when they laid, and when they had fasted and prayed, what did they do? They laid their hands on them and they sent them away. So notice here that he's been operating as a prophet. He's been operating as a teacher. But God, the Holy Spirit, same thing like you see with Moses, right? God, the Holy Spirit, is the one that says, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, because I have a work for them to do. So now, what these guys did now is they prayed and fasted, and watch this now. Then they laid hands on them. Now, two things is happening now when they lay hands on them. They laid hands on them to confirm what the Spirit of God said, to, to confirm, to verify what God has said to them and what's in uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas, and then to commission them or to release them into what God had called them to. You see this? Do y'all see this? Okay? So, so it says, so they being sent, notice that, they being sent. Shambach used to say some, some were called and, and some were sent and some just went. Okay? Well, that's not the, that's not the thing here. It says, so, so being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, they departed to, unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Okay? So how did Paul arrive here? Well, we know one thing. We know, and I told you before, he was on the road to Damascus. He was knocked off his horse. He was saved by the Spirit of God. He went into Arabia. According to the scriptures, here is where this, this revelation, the Lord Jesus gave him this revelation. And in Acts chapter 13, now we see where he's being released from where? From the, from the if you could say from the office, the, the, the office of a prophet, or he's been, he's been released from function in, in one capacity, and he's been moved by the Holy Spirit to function in an entire different capacity. Notice it's the same thing like Moses and Joshua. The laying on of hands confirmed it, or confirm, confirmed them. It, it, didn't, it didn't call them, or they didn't call the individuals, but rather yet it confirmed what God wanted them to do. Are you following me? Okay? It confirmed it. Now, let's look at Acts chapter 14 and verse 4. Let's look at Acts 14 and verse 4. And let's see, let's see what, uh, by the laying on of hands, in obedience to the Holy Spirit, what transpired here. It's, it says here, uh, let's see here. It says here, 
It says, but the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and another part with the apostles. So notice here, Paul here and Barnabas are called apostles. Okay? You follow me? They are called apostles. Where did this come from? Again, the doctrine of the laying on of hands. Where did it come from? How did it happen? Is there, it, 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 was it somebody that just says, I want to make this person this, so I'm going to do that? No. All of this happened, I just read it to you in chapter 13, how God, by the Holy Spirit, spoke this. Okay? And so, and so the, the laying on of hands confirms what the Spirit is saying, and it is not what a person wants to do because they feel like, I'm just going to call this person to do this or to do the other. Okay? Because when you get into that, then sometimes preachers could be what? They could be a respect of person. Okay? There are a lot of things that can get into the way when we do these things. In other words, all I'm trying to show you with this doctrine is that there, there is a, 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 a real truth and a, a, and a need and a necessity for this gift to function properly in the body. Okay? Amen. That's all I'm showing you. That the laying on of hands is a doctrine of the church. And it's not only a doctrine of the church, it is a necessity in the church. The, ch the church culture today is far different. It's far, it's far different today because in many churches now, uh, 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 and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not raining on anybody's parade, but in so many churches now, it's almost like uh, the pastor calls who he feels like calling, so to speak, or who they feel like anointing. God doesn't do that. Okay, it, it, it's not, it is not left up to me or to any other preacher to just. Lay hands on people because we feel like they will fit better here. What is God saying about that person? And what about that person that, uh, it, because what happens sometimes is, it, what if I don't like you? What if you rub me wrong? And I just don't, don't too much care for you. You ain't done anything for, you just kind of rub me wrong. Uh, you may not be one that I'm quickly willing to just lay my hands on and send you forth. This is why God doesn't put it in our hands. He doesn't leave it up to the preachers to determine who to call. God is the one that moves upon us and tells us this and so and so and so and so and it's time for so and so. He is the one that does that. And it has nothing to do with whether you like them or not. That's irrelevant. So it's irrelevant. Don't, don't get me wrong. The person needs to be faithful. Okay, because here's a family that's working. But remember, it's the kingdom that we're talking about. It is, is what daddy wants for us. And not what, what a person thinks ought to happen. I'm not diminishing the office of a pastor, evangelist, prophet, none of them. Okay, but it's the same thing that happened in the Old Testament. God told Moses what to do. God told uh, uh, these prophets it's time for so-and-so. It's time for so-and-so. It's time for so-and-so. And they had no better sense than to do what God said. And the Spirit of God came upon them as a result. Okay? We don't see that sometimes in, 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 in our culture today. Okay? Or in the church culture today. Alright? Sometimes we have to jump through so many hoops have to jump through so many hoops. But remember something. Remember, the church, the pastor, the apostle, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. In the kingdom of God, the only purpose or one of the greatest purpose for these gifts, the Bible tells you in Ephesians 4, okay, that the body might be matured. That we be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Our, our, the, one of the purposes of the, of, of the, of the job that we have, God, God gives us and graces us with these abilities not to control the church or control people's lives. We're to, we're to teach them, God. We're to, we're to lead them. We're to bring them. Now, I understand some of the other things that happen, 
Okay? But our job is to educate these people and bring them to the point where they become mature if they allow that to happen. Okay? Are y'all with me? Okay. So, so you notice that in chapter 13, God had a destiny for Paul. And it was time for him to move from, from going into one direction. It was time for him to change the direction of his life. So, so he was functioning previously as a prophet, right? And as teacher. And now it was time for him to become what? An apostle. So it was time for him to move in a different way, uh, uh, in a different vein. And God was ready for him to do that. And it's the same thing on our lives. Sometimes we're functioning in one capacity. We're moving in one capacity. And something will transpire where God says, now, it's time for you to do this. Now, I'm going to show you how this thing works, okay? So after the Spirit said it, uh, said it to the others, they laid hands on them. And what they did is they confirmed what the Spirit was saying to these guys. So now, you can imagine why confirmation? Because you're fighting a spiritual warfare. Why confirmation? The devil is going to come at you. Why is the enemy going to come at you? Well, he's going to come at you to stop you from doing what God wants you to do. And the enemy likes to attack us when, when, when what God called us to do is in its infancy. And it's, 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 it's what we call in its vulnerable state. Uh, uh, in, 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 it's, in, 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 it's in the vulnerable stage. He likes to do that. He don't want to wait, just like Jesus. He, he said, kill Jesus when he's a baby. Go out there and find the babies two years old and under. Kill them while they're vulnerable. Don't, don't let the dream grow. Don't let the vision grow. Don't, don't let this stuff get really solidified within their spirit. Annihilate it while it is still young. And so the enemy comes at us in order to do that. To frustrate you. To make you feel like, no, God didn't do that. So God likes to confirm. And he'll confirm over and over. And that's why, that's why the blessing of the laying on of hands in the church is so vital. And it's so vital for people to understand this and to do it. God didn't call everybody to do the same thing. And just because someone is confirmed and released don't necessarily mean they leave your church. They might be released to move in the vein that God has called them to do while they're still connected. It's, it happens in various ways. But I've seen where preachers won't let you do anything. And if you and if you do decide, <laughs> if you do decide to, to, to go, go out and do what God called you to do, they cut the rug from under you. That's, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's not what, what the Holy Spirit uh, uh, de desires to do. That's not the kingdom of God. Are you listening here? No, notice here how they function. And they release these people. So just like Paul, we all come to a time where they're, 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 they're God established us in, in the work that he calls for us to do. He, 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 he confirms the work that he's called us to do. Hence, Hence, what is the purpose of you growing? Hello? What's the purpose of you growing? What is the purpose of you maturing? I, I'm a daddy. I've got children. The whole purpose of developing these kids and growing them up is that they can what? One day become what? Self-sufficient. Or they can function as adults. And they can be beneficial to, to society, right? One day they're going to become adults. I want them to be able to get into the craft. That, they, that God calls them to get into and to be successful. There. Every parent understands this. Well, why would God want to do any different? Why would God want any difference for our lives? And so sometimes people are frustrated in the church because there is no confirmation. They don't get confirmed. See? And some of them, if, if God is telling them to move, they realize they have to do that all on their own because ain't nobody going to help them. It's, those things are not part of the kingdom, folks. Are y'all with me? Amen. Look, look at 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. 
Does that make sense what I'm saying? Does it make sense? First Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at this. Chapter 1. Uh, it says Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy. Look at this now. What's it? Now, Paul, Sylvanus. Sylvanus has to be who? Where Barnabas. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Okay. okay? Paul, Sylvanus is the same guy in, in Acts chapter 14, right? The same guy, Sylvanus. It says, Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what he said. Grace be unto you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience uh, of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God the Father. So notice this here. Paul mentions Timothy right in line with him and Sylvanus. And we know that Paul and Sylvanus were called what? What were they? They were apostles. Right? Are y'all with me? Yeah. They were apostles. So you have to ask yourself, well, when did this happen to Timothy? Right? Are y'all are you with me? You have to ask yourself, how did this happen and when did this happen? So so flip over. Let me, let me show you another scripture. Uh, look at chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 2. Look at verse uh, look at verse six and seven. It says, "Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, where we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ." Notice what it says. These are the same guy, Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy. He said, "We did not seek our glory, neither you nor yet of others, where we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ." Notice this. The, the Bible says that even Timothy was an apostle. You know, and t today we make these things so, such a, a really big deal. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, you, 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 have, you have where there are certain trends that happen in the church, and one trend is everybody's a prophet. Everybody calls themselves a prophet. Then you have another trend where everybody calls themselves an apostle. Hey, look, folks, listen to me. Listen to me. The same way God called you to be an apostle is the same way he called you to be a singer. The same way he called you to be a deacon. The same way. Whatever God calls you to do, he equips you. He gives you the necessary tools to get the job done. Okay? So don't make an apostle something where, my God, I could never be an apostle. If you can be a pastor, then if God called you to be an apostle, you can be an apostle. If God called you to be a prophet, then you can be a prophet. What These gifts are the gifts of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the gifts of his government, of his ability. It's not something we have to uh, 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 make happen. It's something that happens to us by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, there are some people who said there's no more apostles now. I understand what Bible they're reading. There ain't no more apostles. So there's only pastors. Okay, maybe the evangelist and the teacher, but there's no more apostle. Some say there ain't no more prophet. Where, where we get that from? If you got one, you've got to have the other four. Are you following me? Amen. So Timothy here is an apostle. Now flip back over to chapter 16 and let's look at how God made Timothy this kind of uh, apostle. How, how did God do this for this guy? Okay, chapter 16 of, of Acts, chapter 16 of Acts. It says here, it says, Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, certain disciples were there, listen to this, named Timothy. So here Timothy is called a disciple. The son of certain women, which was a Jewish, and, and, and believed, but his father was a Greek. It said, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium, him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised them because the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities and delivered them uh, the decrees for the keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established 
and strengthening the faith. So notice it is here where Paul received Timothy. You see that, right? So you have to ask yourself, well, how come Paul got Timothy here? I thought he was with Barnabas, but you, do you remember what happened with Barnabas? Do you remember because John Mark was, 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 was very, uh, uh, John Mark was not solid in the faith? Remember that? And, 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 and Paul talked about bringing John Mark. John Mark came to the work, and then, then when they had to go again, John Mark wanted to go home. And, and Paul and Barnabas got into a, a heated conversation. They, they got into it. Remember that? And Paul and Barnabas said, well, I'll take Paul. I, I mean, I'll take John Mark. And him and John Mark went their way, and Paul went his way. Do you all remember that? Amen. And so when Paul came here, no doubt Paul was also looking for folks who can take their place to go on and continue the work with them, right? Now, what I want you to see here is how it is or how it is that they got a hold of Timothy. Timothy is a disciple here, okay? He's working with them. They said he's a disciple so the people know him. You follow me? The people, the people already see the work that's happening in Timothy's life. They, 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 they are astute to what's going on in his life. Are you following me? They, they can see the gift working in him. Uh, 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 it's hard for sometimes people to go anywhere if, if nobody see your gift. If you are not connected to anything to where what God's put in you can work and grow to a point where it can be seen and the Spirit can say, it's time to separate you. It, this thing works both ways. Sometimes we as leaders don't do the thing we're supposed to do. We don't. And we hurt people and people get get fed up and they, they move on because they can't seem to, to they can't seem to go any further. But on the other side, you have people now that sometimes they don't want to be uh, uh, committed to nothing. They just go as the wind blows them. Are you following me? Well, well, well listen to me. We, didn't, we did not grow in our natural families that way. And families that grow that way grow without being connected. If they're never around each other, they, 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 there's no cohesiveness in the family, then they grow up, but they're not connected. They go there and so say, they're not connected. Even in a natural family, you find that. So in, in, in this family here, uh, 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 Timothy was with, with these guys in Derby and Lystra. This is where uh, the Thessalonians, he was with them. He was serving with them. He was doing the work there. He's, a, he's called a disciple. He's doing the work and they see it. So when Paul comes looking for help, who do they recommend? They recommend the person that they already see working in them. No different that you would do. A matter of fact, we do that today if you need a job, if you need something done, all right? And you find somebody who, 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 who you could say, this person is, 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 good, is good with what he does. And, and the person keeps their word. And boy, I tell you, this is who... Uh, uh, you would want someone to do some work for. And one of your friends said, I need this done. What do you do? You recommend the person that you have had inroads with that you know have done a good job and is dependable. Amen. Same Amen. thing. Amen. Same exact thing. These guys have seen Timothy. Timothy's been with them. He's been working with them. They, they see the gift and the things working in their life. And they see this guy committed to what Christ has given him. And so what they do, they recommend him to Paul. And what they do from there, they lay hands on him. You see that? They lay hands on him. And at this point now, they don't only, they don't only confirm, but they commission him. Because now they release him to go with Paul to the work that God's called him. You say, how do you know this? I'm so glad you asked that question. 
Look at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. So you see, the, the, the laying on of hands doesn't, the laying on of hands is not just something that you do to pray for the sick. It's not just something the, God, the Bible has or the Lord has in the church for you to just simply pray for the sick. That's part of it, okay? But there are other things that's just as pertinent that we are supposed to do with people as they grow. And the Spirit of God, they come to a point where the Spirit of God says, it's time to let this person go. It's time to send this person into the work that I've called them to. All right? Okay, look at... Uh, look at... Uh, uh, look at First Timothy one. Did I say first? Yeah, First Timothy. Oh God, let me see here. Is that right? Am I right? First Timothy. No, Second Timothy. Second Timothy. I'm sorry. Second Timothy. Second Timothy. Second Timothy. Second Timothy. Chapter one. First Timothy. No, Second Timothy. I'm sorry. Second Timothy. Chapter one. And verse six. Look what Paul says here. He says. He said, talking to Timothy. He says, Wherefore I put you in remembrance. Watch what he said now. That you stir up the gift of God. Which is in thee by what? By the putting on of my hands. Notice this here. Paul said, Paul said, stir up the stuff that you got when we laid hands on you. You see? Because when we laid hands on you, God imparted this stuff to you because God had called you to do it. It's in you, Timothy. You may not feel like it's in you. It's in you. You may not feel like anything is happening. And at this point, Timothy was going through pure, 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 pure trouble. He was going through so much trouble that he wanted to quit and leave the church. His elders forsook him and left him. The people that he poured his life into, they all ran away from him because of the persecution that was happening in the church. And Timothy had had it. That's why the Bible says here, for God has not given you a spirit of fear. Notice, Paul is, when you read this book, Paul is talking to him like a father. He said, God hadn't given you a spirit of fear or of timidity, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Why? Because of the persecution, the trials, the trouble, the afflictions that was going on. All right? And Timothy wanted to quit. He wanted to give up. This ain't no time where Timothy wanted to bring any gift out of him. And Paul said, Timothy! He said, I want to remind you. I want you to remember when we laid hands on you, boy, and God called you as an apostle and put the gift on the inside of you. I know you're going through trouble now. I know you don't feel like anything is happening now. But, Timothy, I want you to stir it up. I want you to stir it up. This is, this is where Timothy got it from. Look at chapter 4. Chapter 4. Chapter 4. Is that why? What is that? That's... 1 Timothy 4. Go to 1 Timothy 4. Look at it. Same thing. Same thing. Verse 14. It says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by what? By prophecy. With the laying on of the hands of the presbyter. You see that? He said, Don't neglect the gift. I don't know where you are personal and even the people that are listening to me. But he said, don't neglect the gift. When God confirmed what he called you to and people laid hands on you. All right? He said, they confirmed what God said to you. And if, and if, and if you came to a point where they released you into what God has called you to do, then regardless to where you are, don't give it up and don't neglect it. See? It was confirmed to Timothy by prophecy and the laying on of hands. All right? This is what this is what Acts 16 and verse 1 through 6 says. This is where this is where Paul found this guy and this is where all this began in his life. And so the word of God is teaching him and telling us not not, not to forget this stuff. Don't forget it. See? Because you don't you don't lay hands on people, you don't lay hands on people and make them into what you want them to be. That's not how the church works. We don't lay hands on folks and make them something. 
No, no, no. You lay hands on them and confirm what God has already made them. You lay hands and confirm what God has already called them to be. You lay hands and confirm what the Spirit is saying about that person. That's what happened to David. That's what happened to Joshua. If you go all through the Old Testament, you'll find that's what happened all the way through. Because if I called you to do something and I'm laying hands on you and, and trying to make you to do something, then, then I have to have the power to, to, to give you the, the ability to do that stuff. I don't possess that. You see that? When the Lord said, separate me, this guy. When the Lord said, I'm calling this person to this. And, 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 and they lay hands on them. This is how it happens. This is how the laying on of hands becomes uh, uh, a, a uh, they, they say you, you release something from you to that person. This is how when Moses laid his hands on Joshua, the spirit of wisdom came on him. See, uh, our job is to teach and to train the people. And as they develop, we can see what God is doing with them. And we can, as we hear what the Holy Spirit is saying, then the Holy Spirit releases his people as he sees fit. So, so when people lay hands on folks, they should be declaring the truth of what's already in them or what's already on them and what's going to be of them. That's how it happened to me. Uh, it may not happen to everybody the same. But I remember when I was in the choir. I, I started in the choir shouting amen from the pews. Then they made me a deacon. And all along, God was bringing me and teaching me. He took me and threw me on the streets of New York. Same thing, teaching me. Put me in the evangelistic ministry, teaching me. And I remember, I remember a few years ago, I was, I was preaching a, a, a message. Uh, a few years ago, God gave me a vision or a dream. Uh, whatever it was, it was so real. And, and in this thing here, he spoke to me of my call. He defined the effect that, that the, the call that he's given me will have. I didn't know this bef before then. And so I was preaching one day. I was just preaching and sharing the gospel. And as I was preaching and sharing, when I got through, this person met me and said, can I talk to you a minute? And I took them back to my office. And they looked at me by the Spirit and said, man, you are talking about your own self. And they began to speak to me by the Spirit. And they were telling me what God showed me in the dream that I hadn't told anybody about. You see what I mean? Exact same thing. You see, they were prophesying and declaring what God said and telling me, it's time for you to move into what God's called you to do. No different. No different. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes, sometimes that's how, sometimes it'll work like that. It'll work like that. So, so when hands are laid on you, it's, they're declaring what is true and what they know about you. Or what God has revealed to them about you and about what God has called you to do. So the presbyters could do that. There could be uh, anyone from the fivefold ministry and, and people that are reputable and moved by the Spirit of God. You see what I'm saying? So what I want you all to do is remember, uh, because we are in the body of Christ, we, 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 we function or we should function. I'm sorry. Because we're in, 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 we are Christ's body, we therefore function by Christ's authority. You have to understand that. The, the church is not, is not a, a, a play pen. You understand what I'm saying? The church, the, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, it, it's, it's there for a reason, it's there for a purpose. And the people that are in church, they are not in there to be babies all their lives. They're supposed to grow. They're supposed to mature and come into the fullness of what God had decided or provided for them. What, what God, when he called them, what, what was in his mind when he got a hold of you? When God saved you, what was he thinking about? Huh? 
Well, well, that's what we're talking about. That's what Paul talks about. He talks about in, in uh, Philippians chapter 3. It's not that I've already attained or, or was already perfect, but I follow after to know the one that laid a hold of me. God had a purpose in mind when he created you. He knows exactly how he wants to live in you and how he wants to live through you. And you're, the Holy Spirit's job, or one of the Holy Spirit's job, is to care for this church and to help this church to grow, to help us to grow. And the Holy Spirit brings us in, in, in the destiny that God has for our life because wherever he places us in the body, Remember, the Bible said what he said in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, we were assembled. We were just stuck in the body. The Holy Spirit assembled us. That means he connected you in the place that you fit in the body. He connected you in that place. And so if he connected you there, he knows exactly what you are to be and he knows how you are to function. And when he connects you there, he gives you everything necessary for you to function in that position. So you see, what, what, if we understand that, then there's no need to jock for position in the church. There's no need to fight each other for position. There's no need to war for position. You can't have my position if God didn't give it to you. You already have your position. You have your place in the body. Boy, that frees people up, man. When people understand, it frees you up. We ain't got to be like the world. We're not stepping on folks in order to put our names in lights and, 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 and get the very best of it. There's no need to do that. And Jesus told us in the kingdom, we don't operate like the world. He said, the, the greatest in the kingdom should become your servant. He said, you don't do what the world does. Why is that? Because God has already given you a place. He's already given you a destiny. He's already given you the necessary tools and abilities in order to accomplish the will, purpose, and destiny he has destined for your life. There's no need to fight anybody. There's no need to argue with anybody. There's no need to step on someone in order to, for you to get your chance. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you walk with God, you will have your chance. If you walk with God, you will accomplish what God wants you to do. Man doesn't control this. The Holy Spirit controls it. Because if man controlled it, then boy, and you see it a lot sometimes now. You see it a lot sometimes. Be amazed at folks that are wounded because of what we sometimes preachers have done. Same thing with preachers be wounded by what sometimes members do. But it's 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 a it's a working together, folks. Sometimes I sometimes I have to laugh sometimes when I see folks and, and, and see sometimes what they do, man. What they do. I said, you don't you don't do that on your job. Why would you do that in the kingdom of God? Why would you do that? In, in church, you got to understand the, 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 the responsibility as well as the necessity of what God has called you and I to accomplish. And, and a lot of that is dependent on you listening and following and walking with the Holy Spirit. Remember, we're the body of Christ. And, and we function by that authority. So you and I have to, we, you and I have to function, listen to this, we have to learn how to function in the place that God called us to function. We have to learn how to function in those places. And I did say to you all, I think it was last week, if you don't know what your gift is, then there's no need to, don't get, don't get panicky. Don't, don't panic. If you don't know what it is, just seek the Lord. The Holy, listen to me. It, it is the Holy Spirit's best interest to tell you, and he will tell you. If you don't know it yet, then you just be faithful to God and keep doing what you're doing. The Holy Spirit will bring you to the point where he will reveal it to you. Just like he brought me a few years ago re and, and revealed the depth of what he's called me to do. Same thing. For years, I was doing evangelistic work. I didn't know some of this stuff. And the Holy Spirit just 
met me one night and, and decided it's time to show you. Okay? Sometimes people can handle it at the beginning. Sometimes they can't. The Holy Spirit knows when and how, and He is the one that does it. He is the one that will do it. There, 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 are quite a, there are quite a bit of people, and Lord, don't I know this. Don't I know this. There, there are quite a bit of people uh, in church sometimes that are flustered and frustrated. They've been doing the work for a long time and no one has never confirmed them. Never confirmed them. You see? Never confirmed, never confirmed what God has said for them. And, and, and undoubtedly never really got to a point where they were released by the Holy Spirit. You see? Or, or, or by, you know, uh, those who, who should have. But that, these are, again, this is what the blessing of the laying on of hands do. This is what the doctrine of the laying on of hands does. It, 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 it confirms, with all the other things that it does, it confirms to you and to I. It confirms what the Spirit of God uh, is saying for you to do. And so that's why we need each other. That's why we need the body. See? That's why we've got to stay connected with the Lord. Now, all these things are necessary and essential in all of our lives. What I'm talking about is, is, is not foreign. People do it in, 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 in the secular world. They do it on the job. They do it sometimes when people are going to be promoted. Sometimes you find your boss will call you in and tell you all the things that he's been watching. And he tells you how he has seen you progressing. And he said, we have decided to promote you to this. And boy, when you come out of that office, oh, you feel like a big deal, boy. Because what happened? They confirmed you. They confirmed you. And they put you into something now that's going to require more. But the confirmation gives you so much confidence that you can do it. The same thing today. Amen? Amen. So we're gonna we're gonna stop right here. We're gonna stop right here. But uh, we, you know, I just want us to understand uh, uh, the blessing of what's all what's already there for us, and, and why in the church we do these things and, and the necessity of them. Uh, could you imagine sometimes? how good people would feel? Could you imagine people who are struggling and, 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 and flustered, especially those who have been faithful to God and know the Spirit of God is saying something to them? What, what if that leadership will see it and, and, and instead of thinking sometimes about ourselves, what we want, we understand that our job is to help to develop these people so that God could do with them what He wants to do with them. That's, that, that's our job. The father wants his children to become adults. And when they become adults, the father wants to tell those kids where he wants them. And if that's not where I am, then that's God's business. Because if God can move you, God can bring somebody else. You see what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you tonight. We thank you. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for this word tonight, Lord. Bless the people of they have heard. I hope that we stir their hearts and their spirits. I, I, I hope, dear Father, in Jesus' name, that, that we were able to encourage those who are listening as well as those who are here present tonight. Oh, in Jesus' name, Lord. Bless them. Those who are uh, in a place where they're growing, then uh, let them be patient and continue to grow. Those who may not know what their gifts and, and calling is, Lord, that they will be patient and continue to walk with you and ask you because you will reveal it to them, Lord God. And those who are matured, who have come to that place, dear God, where you're saying certain things to them, Lord, open the eyes of those who, whose eyes need to be opened. Stir hearts, dear Father. 
bring the people, I pray tonight, uh, into the fullness of what you have for them, according to your will and your purpose. And we give you the praise, we give you the glory, and we give you the honor for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Folks, we love you. Thank you all for hanging with me on Facebook. Appreciate you. I uh, hope uh, what we said tonight blessed your heart. Uh, if you've got any questions, you again, you can give us a call or you can drop us a line. And uh, maybe we said something that you don't quite understand or, or you just want us to elaborate on that, then we would love for you to, or, or even while you're on, shoot us a, a message. Uh, we'll be more than happy to address the things that you are uh, concerned about, okay? But but I, I wanted to bring you all and just kind of show you uh, the blessing uh, of the laying on of hands. It's a doctrine of the church. And though sometimes it may seem that some don't do it, I, I want you to understand that God uh, still still need this, this doctrine working effectively in the body. We love you so very much and uh, uh, we thank you so much. God bless you. And we'll talk to you all next week, all right? Bye-bye.